Here we go. Ready? Oh, he's better than me. Yeah. What's up guys? Well, my piece has finally been on display. It's here. It's been here for about a week now and Peter Drummy is the librarian of the Massachusetts Historical Society and he was gracious enough to put a couple of period documents into my secretary and I'm a little freaked out, kind of blown away and I'm just going to let Peter take it away. Um, this is a, a wonderful piece of furniture and what we've done is we've brought out some documents from our collection. The Historical Society is a manuscript repository. It holds uh, personal papers, letters and diaries. So what we have is um, a very famous political print. This is Paul Revere's print of the Boston Massacre that took place on March 5, 1770. And below it, we have two manuscript items from the Adams Family Papers, our largest collection. And here uh, on my immediate left is John Adams's autobiographical account of being of the year 1770 when he was asked to defend the British soldiers um, in the trials that, that arose out of the Boston Massacre. And on the right is his diary back in the spring of 1770 where he starts trying to figure out the arguments he'll use to defend these soldiers who are um, being tried for murder um, in the face of an enormous um, public hostility towards the British Army that was occupying Boston in the late 1760s and early 1770s. I mean, I feel as though it's, it's incredible. I, I was just talking to Peter and he was telling me that, you know, uh, this is basically a ripoff. And, and I find that really intriguing because that's what usually was going on during the day. But it was done in, a, in an artistic way by. Um, was Paul, Paul Revere. Paul Revere, that's right. Not yeah. only did he you know, ride a, a horse, but he actually had a pretty significant role in what was going on at Be the time. Before the revolution, Paul Revere is a, a, a goldsmith and silversmith. So he would have been making the pieces of jewelry and um, the objects that would have, um, the people who would have had a high style piece of furniture would have had in their homes, as well as the sort of pieces of um, uh, silver that it would have like in a church service, um, the, silver, the communion service in a church. But he was also an engraver and he engraved practical things like book plates and advertisements and certificates, but he, but he also made political cartoons. So what he did is, after the Boston Massacre, he made this um, terrific uh, political cartoon which shows the British soldiers uh, sort of lined up in state. <laughs> this is State Street, right in front of the old State House, what was then called King Street, and um, it just shows the British soldiers just shooting the um, uh, Bostonians to pieces. Uh, the Bostonians are shown not a mob or not a riot, but simply kind of standing around with their hands in their pockets, with their little dog in the foreground. And if you were looking at this, if you were out in the countryside or elsewhere, um, except that the, there's a little uh, moon in the upper left-hand corner, I think you'd have a very difficult time knowing that, that the Boston Massacre took place at 9 o'clock at night. Um, you also um, would think that, of course, the British soldiers were guilty and should be found guilty of murder. Um, uh, the, the part about it being a ripoff, there is no copyright back before the American Revolution. <laughs> so what Paul Revere did was he got a hold of someone else's engraving another man in Boston named Pelham who had originally drawn this print and he just copied it. He's an engraver so this is a, uh, engraved into a sheet of copper the size of this print and then it's hand colored and, wow. um, and Revere being a very efficient craftsman he got his copy of Pelham's print out and sold it first and that's oh, how you made okay. your money. So he's doing it for political reasons, to attack the uh, royal government and the British army here in Boston, but he's also a working oh, man yeah. and a businessman, and, 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 and he's making money um, off of this as well. But then um, um, John Adams had to figure out how to, how to defend these now people. How, how, like, I find it really appealing that John Adams in the day 
like defended these British soldiers because he was probably the least liked person in Boston at the time. I mean, and, it, and, it, and he was, a, he was a, a, this revolutionary movement that started, um, we refer to as the Patriot Cause. He was a sincere patriot. He believed in even, independence. Even when he was, even when he was doing this. Oh, what wow. he said is, people have a right to a fair trial no matter who they are. Even the most hated people in Boston, British soldiers, nevertheless have a right to a fair trial. He also was concerned there was a real divide. He's, a, he's um, a supporter of the Sons of Liberty and the revolutionary movement, but he's afraid that if um, mob violence breaks up in Boston, oh, yeah. the revolutionary movement could break could down break, so. into anarchy. So he's trying to walk a balance. Um, if in, his, in his autobiography, he remembers that the next day a young Irish guy came on behalf of the British soldiers and asked them to ask him to defend them. Oh, the story okay. probably is a little more complicated. The, uh, the patriot leaders, uh, Joseph Warren and Samuel Adams and John Hancock, they probably really wanted these soldiers to get at least the appearance of a fair oh, yeah. So there were probably well, some scheming behind that. Right? Yeah, that's right. To show Boston, eat the Boston, you could get a fair <laughs> trial. So it was kind of a double game. But whatever, the, whatever his motivation, it's really one of the. It's it's an ornament on Boston. Oh, if there's okay, anything so we have cool. to be proud of, is that people could get a, a fair trial here. Um, uh, two of the soldiers were convicted of manslaughter. That is, that they had fired without orders. Okay. Um, and now um, they were the, the were they the uh, officers? No, no. The officer was. There were two trials. First, the, the officer, Captain Thomas Preston, was found not guilty. And then the eight private soldiers, the privates, were tried together. And two of the, the eight were found guilty of manslaughter. The other six okay. um, were found innocent. And at that time, um, they had a system. Uh, manslaughter, was, manslaughter was a capital crime. You were being oh, executed. Right. And just as you were Yeah, you know, the difference wow. between being different between being convicted of murder and manslaughter, there was no difference in the punishment. <laughs> But they, they, there was mercy in the law, and they had something that had come down from the Middle Ages called benefit of clergy. And benefit, benefit of clergy meant that um, basically you showed that you could read, read wow. the Bible, and I don't know if these two soldiers could read or not. They may have just memorized the passage. But anyways, they stood up in court and they read or pretended to read a brief passage from the Bible, and then they were basically let off. It was like being pardoned for your first offense. Okay. But they wanted to make sure that you weren't pardoned for a second offense. So what they were, they were branded on their hands. Oh, oh, oh. Not as a punishment, not as a torture, yep. but they were branded so you would have the permanent mark that you had been convicted of a more. felony okay. and pardoned by benefit of clergy so that you wouldn't do, you know, you couldn't oh, get a second you pass. Doing you couldn't keep doing yeah, right, it. You carried around with you on your body that evidence. So you have something really modern, this fair trial taken down by a shorthand reporter, so we know what John Adams that's said. In his diary, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's his diary, but then okay. it's t taken down and published. At the same time, we have appeal to something that goes way back to the Middle Ages, when only clergymen could read. That's okay. where that benefit yeah. of clergy phrase comes from. Is the, uh, the, the assumption is if you could read, that meant you were a, a, you know, a churchman, a priest, okay. or a minister. So, so you have those things going on, and this is the essence of what we have here. We have in our, our building, which is, it has wonderful furniture, uh, a period furniture that's um, like your piece. We have, um, um, but everything in our collection, paintings and engravings and newspapers and maps, later on photographs, they're all here to support research on manuscripts, yeah. letters and diaries of yeah, individuals and families, and yeah. millions of documents. And thousands of collections. collections. And this is the oldest collection? This is the first historical society in America. This wow. The historical society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, was founded in 1791, right after the Revolution, because there were 10 men in Boston who were concerned that the history of the Revolution would be lost when the revolutionary generation oh, um, yeah. um, uh, fell away. We have a connection with Paul Revere because the founders of the historical society um, uh, just a few years after its founding, in 1798, um, the secretary, a minister in Boston named Jeremy Belknap, wrote to Paul Revere and he said, what did happen the night of your... <laughs> he, he wouldn't have said famous ride because it, it wasn't famous, famous ride. So for the historical... He didn't even make it the whole way, did he? Well, 
it, this is an interesting story. For There's the no historical idea. society, um, Paul Revere wrote out an account, a long letter that described everything we know about his ride, he wrote it himself. And Paul Revere gets a reputation of being kind of a shameless self-promoter. Well, he is from Canton, like me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but what happens is, Paul Revere wasn't looking for any credit. He just had Tell been the story, there. Right? But he did, he, in a, in a, his ride was a success because the point was to get to Lexington, where Sam Adams and John Hancock were, and to spread the alarm from there. When Paul Revere tried to go on from um, Lexington on to Concord, uh, the British had sent um, officers on horseback out ahead, and he got picked up between Lexington and Concord. Oh. Another rider out that night, Billy Dawes, William Billy Dawes, Dawes, who had escaped out of Boston in a different way, they hadn't rode across the Charles River but had gone by land, he managed to get on and spread the alarm further. And um, they had just, when they were riding along the, the countryside, out in the middle of the night, oh, actually oh, in the early morning, you know, in the middle of the night, and they happen upon a um, young doctor who's going coming home from visiting a young woman friend. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. right. I, New England, Colonial New England was a more interesting place yeah. than sometimes well, they they from history really book. <laughs> so, so that man, Samuel Prescott, he carried the alignment. He knew oh, the countryside. Yeah. So Dawes and Prescott got away from the British and it spread the alarm further. They took Revere's horse and just, the British did, and just sent him back to Lexington. So he was in Lexington the next morning when the fighting oh, began. Wow. So, so you, people say, well, he, he, didn't, um, he didn't ride to Concord like it says in the famous Longfellow poem. But I think that is missing well, the point. Pretty, yeah, well, he did make it to, Con to yeah, Lexington. Yeah, and the other, part of, this, the other right? part of it is, when Longfellow wrote this poem, he wasn't, at the time of the American Civil War, he wasn't writing it for the purposes of um, telling history. He was saying, as the Civil War approached, that they needed someone to spread oh, the alarm, okay. just as, as Paul Revere had spread the alarm. And Longfellow, who was a member of the Historical Society, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, he probably saw Paul Revere's letter on display when the um, when the Historical Society was then down on Tremont Street in downtown okay. Boston, not far from here, um, uh, and that probably inspired him to write. Oh, to write the long so, so, yeah. so we're connected with this story in a really wonderful way. That's and great. we have Paul Revere's business papers when he moved out to well, Canada can. um, and wow. had his copper rolling business after the revolution. He went into that business. In Canton. Yeah. Now, what I think is terrific about the, the Adams family and all these uh, documents and even the, the, all the documents that you have here at the Historical Society is that we have, well, you guys have the uh, papers of John Jr.'s papers from the Amistad, correct? Yes. I mean, no, John, people may yeah, not really know that. Well, John Quincy Adams was three years old when the Boston Massacre took place. He was born in 1767. He grew up, went with his father to France during the Revolution was the Secretary of State and the President of the United John States. Was the John Quincy John Adams was the Secretary wow. of State and then the sixth that. President of the United States. Okay. And then um, and then after he was defeated for re-election, he was in the Congress. He went back and was in the, the Congress from Massachusetts. After he was the President? After he was the President. Wow, this is probably the guy. only time that's happened. And when he's an old guy, because in the 1840s, um, some slaves in Cuba had escaped by capturing the ship. They were being transported from one place to another in Cuba. Yeah. And they they thought they were sailing back to Africa, but were tricked into sailing to North America. Oh, boy. So they were taken prisoner here. And then the question was what to do with them. And a lot of people said, well, send them back to um, Spanish Cuba, and mm -hmm. that would have been the end of them. They yeah. had killed the, the oh, they people killed on the slave the ship. Yeah. But, um, uh, uh, people said, no, these people have fought for their freedom. They were, they were, they were illegally captured and brought to Cuba. Um, and um, the people defending them, um, uh, the Amistad is the name of the ship that came to America, they came to America on. Um, um, the people defending them, this is a case that went up to the United States Supreme Court, and they had John Quincy Adams, a former president, a former secretary of state, a person who had argued cases as a young man before the Supreme Court. Wow. Now this is a long time later. Well, this, is, attorney, huh? this is seventy years after. Seventy years after the Boston Massacre. 
his, he still has the same value as his dad. Well, he did. His father was protecting people who were the British soldiers, incredibly unpopular. The son is defending people, um, slaves from Africa, who, um, who have no rights, yeah. um, arguing for their freedom. And the Supreme Court freed them, and and, arranged, and their um, supporters arranged for them to be go returned to, to go home. That's so this is a great home. story, and again, it's that's, all that's told here. Yeah, and, yeah, all told here in diaries and letters. I know, and you know what's even more? I mean, I still love like the connection to all this. I mean, you know. Boston, Massachusetts was the first all-black regiment in in um, the Civil War. So the 54th I mean, regiment. The 54th. Now there is a ton of history in this building, and we could stay here for days and looking at this stuff. And I really appreciate you taking the time out to school me a little bit and make me feel like I need to go. No, no, this is <laughs> and there couldn't be a more appropriate. I'm, I'm really, look, I'm really humbled by this whole experience, and I don't really know how to quite take it all in yet. I just want to say thank you for you. Well, come back to this. Thank you.